collapse this real quick. Perfect. All right, yep, I will be speaking about the impact of the black summer wildfires on at-risk Heteroptera in the Northeast Forest of New South Wales. Uh, my co-authors are Jerry Cassis, uh, Marina Chang, Bill Sherwin, and Sean Laffin, um, all of UNSW. I begin by acknowledging the Gadigal and Wangal peoples of the Eora Nation, uh, traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking from today, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Uh, I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Uh, we also thank our co-contributors, Chris Reed, Wendy Shaw, uh, Arlie McMaw, Zoe Blush, uh, Aidan Runnagall McNall, the New South Wales National Park and Wildlife Service, Australian Threatened Species Commission, the Australian Government Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, uh, especially for providing funding through the Wildlife and Habitat Bushfire Recovery Program. So, Assessing the conservation of invertebrates is a challenge in Australia. Uh, this is despite the fact that 75% of all living eukaryotes are invertebrates. There's a massive taxonomic impediment due to numerous undescribed species, as well as sampling inadequacy relative to regions like North America and Europe, where a lot more research has been uh, done on invertebrates, um, and especially again compared to other taxonomic groups like mammals and birds. Many invertebrate species are narrowly distributed, uh, which put them at risk of landscape level disturbances, such as wildfires. With the forests of the Great Dividing Range of Eastern Australia, um, kind of a hotbed of organismal diversity, we hypothesize that this region uh, represents a heightened invertebrate extinction threat, especially given the events of the 2019 and 2020 uh, wildfires, which were massive both in scale and severity. So with these black summer uh, wildfires, up to 5.3 million hectares were burnt uh, throughout Australia, mostly concentrated in the eastern portion of the country. These were high intensity fires that impacted fire resistant habitats that had never before been burnt, uh, such as Gondwan and rainforests, where we have histories of the rainforest stretching back millions of years. And this is the first time that uh, we've been able to record traces of fires within these habitats. There's been astronomical losses of wildlife due to these wildfires. Uh, the estimated number of vertebrates lost was in the billions, uh, which leaves the question of how many invertebrates were lost if billions of vertebrates were. Um, but that impact on invertebrate species is very difficult to quantify. So we chose Heteroptera as a target group to assess the impact of these bushfires on invertebrate fauna uh, within Northeast New South Wales. Heteropterans account for about 3% of described animal diversity across all of the animals. Many of these species are phytophagous or plant feeding. Um, and these phytophagous taxa are often very host specific, uh, concentrating on only one or two species. And these hosts are often uh, also closely related like in one genus or a, maybe a family um, of plants. This makes these bugs susceptible to environmental disturbance that affects the host plants, such as bushfires. Um, we also hypothesize that non-fire adapted perennial plants may be slower to recover and therefore the impacts of their disturbance on the bugs that are use them as hosts would be greater. So our goal was to evaluate whether any of our target taxa warrant protected status, either under the Australian federal government or the IUCN. We used the IUCN criteria to assess these, uh, um, these at-risk species. These high priority risk species will then be nominated to the Threatened Species Scientific Committee under the Australian federal government based on the area of occupancy and the extent of occupancy genetic diversity and population size, or the number of individuals that we're able to uh, recover. The area of occupancy is specifically the, um, the actual area that the species occurs. And the standard is to use a four square kilometer buffer around each individual point. The extent of occupancy is a polygon drawn around all the points 
uh, present forest species throughout this entire record. And so based on how large these areas are, we could determine how threatened the species actually are. So our study area was in the Australian state of New South Wales, which is in the southeast portion of the country. In particular, we focused on what we call the Northeast Forest Area, which is an area to the northeast part of the state that's about 104,000 square kilometers. Uh, to determine which true bug taxa would be a target for this project, we examined historical collection data for true bugs within Australia. This data was sourced mostly from the Planetary Biodiversity Inventory, or the PBI, um, which hosts museum collection records from around the world. We examined specimens from the UNSW insect collection, which is comprised primarily of true bugs from Australia. We also restricted our search to the Northeast Forest region, so only species that occurred within this area. The target we selected were based on the restricted range. So um, were they limited to only the Northeast Forest area or did they widely occur throughout Australia? And also the percent of historic records occurring within areas that had been burnt by these uh, wildfires. Based on these selection criteria, we eventually settled on seven primary target taxa. Um, all of these had 10 or more verified records with museum specimens, and 50% or greater of those records had been burnt in the uh, 2019 or 2020 wildfires. For our field work, we revisited these historic sites, um, or tried to revisit as many of them as possible. Uh, <laughs> revisiting all of them was a bit impossible. Some of them were no longer in uh, accessible areas. You know, tra fire trails had disappeared. Uh, weather conditions were pretty horrible during field work, but we tried to get to as many as we could. Um, we specifically looked at areas um, at these historic sites that were uh, had their, their host plants present. So we had looked up the species host plants and concentrated on those uh, host plants in particular, but we also beat around the, the vegetation around them to see if we could locate these individuals. In addition to these historic sites, um, we also added other sites kind of at an ad hoc basis um, based on the distribution records of the host plants. Overall, we visited 122 sites throughout our survey, uh, 54 of which, or 44%, uh, were burnt. You can see the burnt sites are the kind of pinkish color there on the, the site, while their unburnt sites were in black. These seven bugs uh, were our target species for this project. We ultimately collected five of our seven target taxa. Um, we collect these from 33 different sites, 11 of which were burnt. Uh, Kirkaldia Rigosa was collected in one burnt site. Uh, Cetocris, which is a new species actually, uh, was collected from six burnt sites. And a new species of Woodwardiola was collected from four burnt sites. These burnt sites actually had specific characteristics and that set them apart from other burnt sites that we also had sampled and that microhabitats within these burnt sites remained unburnt. Um, and we were able to collect specimens off of those unburnt areas. The other thing that uh, these sites had was that they often had host plants that were highly adapted to fire and were found flourishing after the fire had moved through these areas. Epimixia volturna, which is our first uh, target species, we only found at unburnt sites. Its host plant, um, which is the river she oak or Casuarina cunninghamiana, is not adapted to fire. Um, you can see in the photo here, this was an area that uh, the species had occurred previously and we had gone to sample, but the area even two years post fire had failed to recover and we weren't able to recover any individuals from this site. Um, its area of occupancy was 96 square kilometers, which puts it in endangered, uh, but its extent of occupancy is quite large and puts it in least concern. Uh, our second target species is Eratingus trivergata. Uh, we only were able to recover it from one site. Um, this species was a little bit different in that 
out of all of our species, it was mainly found in rainforest areas historically. Um, and rainforest habitat is actually incredibly difficult to sample. It's got high canopies. Um, the species focuses on very massive rainforest trees. And so uh, our lack of finding this specimen is probably due to the fact that it's very difficult to collect in the best of circumstances. Um, so while rainforest sites did burn in the, the wildfires, uh, in general, it's not a habitat that's in, under great threat to wildfires, but it is under threat from other um, factors such as land clearing for agriculture. Um, it has another small area of occupancy of 72 square kilometers, um, and then a smaller extent of occupancy of uh, 281,000 square kilometers, putting it as endangered and least concern. Our third species is an undescribed species of uh, Cetocarus that our lab has actually been working on. Um, we do have many records for the species. So it's pretty well documented. Um, and we did find it on a fair few sites, six sites. Uh, but every one of these sites was actually burnt. And that's because its host plant, which is the um, predatory plant Drosera vinata, is highly fire adapted. You can see it's thriving here in a, a very burnt site. The soil was turned black from charcoal and it's coming up through. Um, so these were quite numerous in these burnt areas. Uh, it has a small area of occupancy again, um, but it has a massive extent of occupancy. It's found in a fair few areas in Australia, um, but the area of occupancy is still listed as endangered. Um, Remecoroides grossi, we weren't able to uh, discover during our, our field work. Um, it's a grass specialist, uh, and it doesn't occur probably more widely outside of our study area than any of the other species in our, um, on our list. Uh, but all of the areas that it occur were actually heavily impacted by the wildfires. So this species will need a lot more research done on it to see uh, uh, what's going on with it and whether or not it's um, impacted. It still has a very small area of occupancy, but a quite large extent of occupancy. Um, Cacaldiella rugosa, we found from two sites, one of which was burnt. Uh, in the burnt site, we recovered quite a few individuals, but it was an unburnt microhabitat uh, actually surrounding a national park building that had been saved from the fire. So all the lush vegetation that was surrounding it we were able to find these species, but uh, when I had surveyed in the burnt areas immediately surrounding it on the same host plant, we were unable to find uh, this species. Uh, it has an area of occupancy of 80 square kilometers, putting it under endangered, but again, a fairly large extent of occupancy. Uh, Kirkaldiella shuai, um, even though it's similar to Kirkaldiella rugosa, we were not able to find during the survey. Uh, unlike Kirkaldiella rugosa, this species is confined to a single mountaintop in New South Wales. Uh, if you notice, it's got an area of occupancy of 28 square kilometers, which is definitely larger than uh, the size of a mountaintop. But that's because this includes some dubious records um, that were in the PBI database. Uh, these records weren't positively identified. Uh, this species needs genitalic dis dissections in order to correctly identify. Um, so this one's probably potentially more imperiled than any of the other species, given its very, very limited distribution. Um, the extent of occupancy being quite large at 711 square kilometers is due to those dubious records, um, which I believe are in South Australia. So they're, they're over a thousand kilometers, maybe 2000 kilometers away from their known site on, on the top of uh, Mount Capitar. Uh, our last species is another undescribed um, species in the genus Woodwardiola. Uh, like Cetocarus, we have quite a few collection records of this uh, historically. Um, again, it's pretty well documented. Um, this one we found at the most sites of any of the species that we recorded during our field trip, uh, 23 sites, four of which were burnt. But like Caldiella rugosa, anytime we recovered it in a burnt site, it was from an unburnt microhabitat. Uh, you can see here that there's some green vegetation in the foreground. Specifically, this species is on, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, uh, this plant here, Lamander longifolia. Uh, 
um, which is looking nice and healthy, but you can see some burn areas in the background immediately adjacent to this area. Um, now, Lamander longifolia is actually quite fire adapted as well. Uh, you can see here it's a heavily burnt area, and all of this green is actually Lamander longifolia. It's completely taken over the site, but we didn't find a single wood wardiola within this um, spot, even though its host plant is everywhere. So this species seems to uh, be a slow recolonizer of, of burnt areas, um, as we'd find it in any spot that was unburnt next to the areas such as these. Um, its area of occupancy is 116 square kilometers, still putting it as endangered, uh, with an extent of occupancy of 130 square kilometers. So every one of our target species was assessed as endangered under the area of occupancy, and also as least concern under the extent of occupancy. Um, and this is kind of due to the limited number of historic records of uh, true bugs, where they're widely scattered across uh, the landscape. And so this uh, shows a small area of occupancy, but a quite large extent of occupancy. Um, couple this with the difficulty in verifying the presence of populations for a given taxon of true bug, uh, these traditional species risk assessments um, are problematic when assessing these sorts of invertebrate taxa. Um, so because of this, we actually adjusted um, the endangered recommendation of the area of occupancy to data deficient. Uh, we just weren't able to verify at enough sites whether or not our target species were actually present. So in order to address this sort of deficiency in um, species assessments, uh, we need to develop different strategies uh, for proper monitoring of these invertebrate taxa. Um, the most important thing would be to establish long-term uh, monitoring um, of any at-risk invertebrate taxa um, continuing to go back to the same sites, collecting these individuals over time and, and um, trying to keep track of their, their demographics. So one of the ways that we have decided to try and um, address this kind of lack of strategies uh, is to use population genetics as a method for um, evaluating populations of these at-risk species. So we wanted to look to see whether these bushfires are actually acting as a barrier to dispersal. Um, to determine this, we're working with Australian Museum to examine the population structure of two different invertebrate species. One of them is a true bug. The other one is not of interest to this group, but it's a rather nice looking dung beetle, uh, flightless dung beetle. Um, Amphitosomus uh, primonactus is, is that species. So the overarching question for this portion of the study was how related is one population of these, one of these species to the other populations of these species? Uh, in particular, how related are um, populations within burnt areas related to those that are unburnt or vice versa, or any combinations of these? So to look at this, we collected samples uh, from populations that were separated by bushfires, like between A and C here, but we also collected samples for populations that were not separated by bushfires, like between A and B. Uh, we can calculate whether bushfires are acting as barriers to dispersal by examining single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are single DNA base pairs that uh, vary from a reference sequence. So you can see here in the top sequence, our A has changed over to a C. By examining the variation in these single nucleotide polymorphisms, we can calculate various genetic differentiation metrics that provide us information on the state of these populations. These metrics fall under two broad categories, uh, within locality measures and between locality measures. Within locality measures uh, include expected heterozygosity and observed heterozygosity which inform us about the overall genetic diversity within each population. Um, Shannon's entropy has a similar purpose to heterozygosity, but is more sensitive to rare alleles that might occur within a population. Heterozygosity typically uh, starts picking up um, very common 
uh, alleles within a population, and so can sometimes overwhelm signals of, of rarer alleles. Uh, between population measures include FST, which is a, uh, a function of heterozygosity and is commonly used for these um, sorts of population genetic studies. So it should be very easily uh, compared to other data sets. Um, we also included Shannon's mutual information, which is a function of Shannon's entropy, and again, is more sensitive to rare alleles. Um, we can take these between population measures and then adjust them for uh, distance. So account for the, the effect of geographic distance between these populations uh, by using an, what's called an isolation by distance test, uh, which is an adaptation of FST um, to try and eliminate the, that effect of, of distance between genetic information of populations. So once that effect of geographic distance is taken into account, we can then directly assess the impact of fires on the genetic diversity of these insects. Uh, the map you see here is for amphistomus, um, and it nicely illustrates the kind of variety of burn conditions that you see between sites. You can see that there's sites where there's a lot of fire um, intensity between them. There's sites that have gaps of fire intensity between them. So to quantify this amount of fire intensity, we applied uh, buffers both at the point and in the uh, for each pairwise pair. And these buffers were 50 meters, 100 meters, and 200 meters to account for different home range sizes um, and different movement corridors between these populations. Uh, we then applied uh, the average burn intensity within each of those uh, buffers. Our plan is to, to, to then take the various genetic information um, metrics that we have and run a regression with uh, these burn intensities to determine whether or not those burn intensities are having effect both within a population and between populations. Um, and this is the point of the project that we're actually right in the middle of. We are um, still filtering and, and sorting out our um, our genetic uh, data sets. Um, so our work is ongoing in that regard. Uh, the genetic data actually was, was quite messy. Um, and uh, it's been a huge amount of work trying to, to work through that. But we should be getting some results soon. And it looks like, at least for the, the dung beetle, um, that uh, with our preliminary analyses, that fire actually doesn't seem to have had an effect on that species in particular. Uh, we don't have a uh, result for the lace bugs yet. That data set is in a little bit worse shape, um, but it should hopefully give us either a similar or a different story, um, given that they have two different sort of uh, life histories. We do hope that overall um, this unique, this technique proves to be rather informative um, and hopefully provides us a new tool for monitoring these sorts of populations. Um, not only for like disturbance after fires, but for any sort of uh, landscape type uh, monitoring to see how the genetic health of these populations is uh, proceeding. And with that, I've reached the end of the road of my talk, um, and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you. More applause. Hey, is, uh, do I have questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question. Yes, Toby. Uh, your comments reminded me of visits to uh, the Stirling Ranges and also Fitzgerald River in Western Australia that I would participate in with Jerry. Uh, I'd never seen areas that were under uh, fire management like, like these two when we visited them. And I don't know how long it had been since they were burned, but they were, the landscape was pretty stark. And where we did find bugs was exactly as you suggest in areas where, where the fires were, just couldn't, couldn't get to them easily. Uh, and, and there were a lot of bugs. And my, my conclusion would have been in those cases that, that the uh, regeneration of the insect populations, forget about the plants, which is what the fire management is all about, I believe. 
uh, regeneration of insect populations would be dependent on um, these railway, un in most cases, railway unburned areas or completely untouched areas to repopulate some of the, some of the wider range of habitats within those two conserved areas directed by the Earth. Yeah, um, so that was kind of the the idea that I had as well was that, um, especially with like wood wardiola, it was the easiest to see where you would have literally a an unburnt 